Our last speaker today is Paul Rogers. Uh, we have him to thank largely for lots of uh, the planning that's gone into the, the conference this year and in past years, I think. Uh, Paul is the director of the Western Aspen Alliance and he's an adjunct associate professor here at Utah State University. Uh, Paul's research on lichens and forests has taken him around uh, the region as well as uh, the globe in Europe and Australia and he's currently working on issues related to wildlife impacts and benefits to Aspen e ecosystems. See, can you hear me okay? Because I'm going to move around, hopefully keep you awake. First of all, I appreciate all of you who stayed this long. I was going to hide some money under a few seats just for those who stay later. And I may still have, so make sure to check all the seats before you leave. Um, I'm going to jump right into it. Quaking Aspen, um, a burning desire and asbestos forest. How many have heard this term, the asp an asbestos forest? Half or more of you. So this, there's, a, there's a little schizophrenia going on with this species, and I hope to unravel that a little bit for you. Uh, my co-author, Kevin Krasnow, was here yesterday. He had to return to Teton Science School to teach a class. Um, and I'll get into the burning desire uh, intimately near the end of the show, so don't go anywhere. I'm going to try over here. So you can see this uh, already. There's, there's uh, some different things going on on a single burned landscape. This is, by the way, Monroe Mountain, which you've heard about quite a bit yesterday. Some areas uh, burn with aspen, some don't, some are mixed with other things, so we have a variety of things happening there. Uh, here's where I'm headed in this talk. Um, why should we care? That'll be short and sweet because you've heard that a million times, but what, we need to cover that to lay a basis for some people who are not familiar with this. I want to talk about changing paradigms in uh, aspen communities. That's very important. There's a lot of recent research going on. Uh, one of the main missions of the Western Aspen Alliance is to get that information out to land managers, decision makers, and researchers. I'm going to talk, uh, focus in on functional and uh, fire types, more fire types for this talk, and then end with sort of a hodgepodge of things uh, revolving around the topic of resilience or management and giving up the punchline. This is my version of resilience, and it's about adapting. Uh, as somebody mentioned yesterday, both people and science and uh, management adapting. So uh, these are some of the papers that I'm going to be dependent on, mostly the first two on top, some of Kevin's work in California, a, a synthesis paper that I did with some other fire ecologists a couple of years ago, also this functional types, and then this uh, ecological importance of mixed severity fires. You've already heard that term kind of uh, demonized. I'll just sort of leave it at that, and I think there's probably some good reasons for it. But I think once you read that book, you'll really find that they're focused in on high severity fires. Uh, largely, but I, I don't want to pick up that bellywick right now. Um, why should we care? All of these reasons, high biodiversity, recreation, water, fire protection, aesthetics, forage, wood products. Something I didn't put up here in the recreation specifically is that most ski resorts in the uh, U.S. are actually real estate games. They don't make a lot on skiing, but they sell, sell property at the base because the ski resort's on federal lands. And a lot of those are, uh, communities uh, involve Aspen, and you can barely pick up a ski brochure without seeing pictures of Aspen. So maintaining the health of them, uh, particularly around homes and on ski, and ski resort property, is an important uh, thing there uh, that we'll probably hear more about. But I think I want to change the tune a little bit. There's something about our professional pride that we have to think about as well with Aspen ecosystems. Uh, I've, I've heard a couple of uh, managers, one specifically the district ranger that's, that, that governs the district where the Pando clone is, if you're not familiar with that, it's thought to be the largest living thing on earth. It's 106 acres and roughly 47,000 stems of one individual, one genetic individual in central Utah. And the, the district ranger said, I just don't want this thing to fail on my watch. That's a whole nother talk, the Pando clone, but this is an example from the, I can't remember the name of the fire in Flagstaff, near Flagstaff, Arizona, in which uh, there's not a lot of vegetation growing back. What's in the foreground is a lot of aspen stems that have been browsed intensely in a high severity burn. What's in the midground there is a lot of uh, earth and wood movement that probably could have been avoided had there been some, um, some healthy regrowth of aspen and, and all of the, the species that depend on aspen coming in. 
So that's an important thing here. So, so I basically have the, uh, the maxim that we can do better, and I think a lot of folks think we can too, but it gets quite complex and interdisciplinary here involving wildlife, forest management, um, browsing livestock, all of these things, recreation, water, all come into play when we're talking about a bigger picture of aspen management. So uh, very quickly, some things that have changed perhaps from your, your, your traditional aspen uh, management and understanding on the left to sort of new paradigms that are evolving. Evolving. I won't read all those out loud, but I'll, I'll relate a story. I used to work for the same outfit that the previous speaker worked for, and I had a boss there that said, why is everybody so excited about paradigms? I'm sick of hearing about paradigms. Paradigms, it's only 20 cents. <laughs> There's all this talk about paradigm change. And it's like, okay, yeah, yeah. He actually said that. But, um, so some important things here. Um, sexual reproduction thought rare just 10 years ago. We're just, we've, we, it's just in its infancy, the ecological importance of sexual reproduction over time and, and, and spatial scale. So that's really important, but also there's many different types of aspen. If you're managing with one formula for aspen, either clear fell coppice or, uh, or trying to burn off aspen, then uh, stay tuned here. So things are changing rapidly and there's some good uh, information to support that. I highly recommend this paper by uh, Jim Long and Karen Mock from here. For those people of a silvicultural persuasion, I had some on the table, they all disappeared, and I'm glad of that. Because it's really, it's really uh, something to get you thinking in a practical sense how you might want to do things a little differently. <clears throat> so just this idea of, uh, of um, seedlings on the right and your sort of uh, aspen sprouting, asexual and sexual reproduction, uh, we have all these documentations of, of this situation uh, where we found seedlings mostly on fires. We have one exception here, which is a very important exception, where they did a clear cut at an elevation where aspen didn't previously exist. And there's seedlings in there. So that's sort of an important finding that came out there. But then some of the other ones highlighted you. I, I highlighted them because there's photos in here of those situations and, and Kevin Krasnow's work. Um, in, Arizona, in uh, California is highlighted in some of his pictures to follow. But an important there, thing there is almost all of these situations that I'm aware of, or all of them, other than the clear fell coppice, were, were uh, seedlings um, regenerating in high intensity fires. So I'm going to sort of stump a little on the importance of high intensity fires at variety of scales. I'm not saying total burn area, but high intensity fire is more and more important. <clears throat> this is just a quickie from Kevin's work in, in the Sierra Nevada, but uh, notice here the survival rate wasn't very good over time, but nonetheless they had a lot of seedling coming in there. Uh, so just a quick landscape look, this is the Bridger Teton Forest, National Forest plus Teton National Park. And just to break this down, I don't think this is atypical of a lot of national forests, but this is one of the largest national forests in the West. So as an example, this is the amount of acres mapped, uh, total acres in Aspen, it's a small percentage, but ecologically very important. Uh, then the area burned, as far as they know, pretty good records for this forest since 1931 about 14% of Aspen. If you calculate that out, uh, we have a 587-year rotation period. Um, that's uh, pretty darn long to beyond what most of any forest, other than yesterday I heard about an alfalfa field that had a 1,000-year had a rotation or so. Um, so. So we're probably out of whack there. Uh, some in this room would argue that that's because of fire suppression. I would argue that it's like most fire, and we've heard over and over again, it's really climate driven. The 20th century in many, many parts of the West being the wettest century in the last thousand years. Either way, we don't have time to argue over that too much, but the mean age of uh, Aspen, uh, oh, around 100 or more years. So a lot of these stands were begun during the settlement, just post-settlement era, uh, prior to some really wet periods in the early 20th century, uh, on average. So that just gives you one, one large landscape look. But wait a minute, folks, that's not all. Uh, 
not all Aspen are fire dependent. I think many of you heard this message. I'm going to hit it pretty hard here. This is from southern Utah and Boulder Mountain. You have these multi-age stands that are driven by a completely different ecological function and are going to rarely, if ever, burn. So we need to be aware of that. Uh, I know a district ranger also on the Fish Lake Forest who tried repeatedly to burn and burn and burn these uh, moderate high elevation stands and it wasn't working. He was throwing his hands up. Well, uh, probably did not evolve, evolve with fire, these types of stands. So just a quick uh, uh, overview of uh, another whole talk on aspen functional types. Uh, just serial aspen, maybe your traditional aspen ecology and management. Uh, I don't know what percentage of a total aspen is made up in that. This is a project pending that I need to get together with the FIA folks and, and figure out, try to get a number on that. But I've heard it's roughly a two-thirds serial to one-third um, stable aspen, and that will vary quite a bit by, by region and subregion. And then the stable, we've broken down into other parts, uh, other uh, types, because they function differently within the stable type. The parklands here in Canada, this large Colorado plateau type, some more smaller landscape types I'll get to in a minute, um, and then some that go either way in these riparian zones. Again, function ecologically different because of ready source of water. What I'm driving at is you wouldn't treat those all the same if, if, uh, if you're trying to... Um, trying to understand the ecology of them. So, and they're not necessarily exclusive. For example, the Colorado Plateau is full of cereal aspen as well. It's not all one or the other, and on the same landscapes, on one side of the hill or the other, you could have these different types. And here's an illustration of that. This is locally in the Bear River Range. There's a cartoon of it on the lower left there, pointing out these types. It's illustrated pretty well in these photos. Uh, they're gonna burn very differently, of course. Um, and at the same scale, roughly, these isolated stands, here someone's built a home in that one, but not particularly fire-prone landscape in a, in a not uh, very fire-prone aspen forest, pure aspen forest or stable. By the way, some people use the term persistent or stable or pure. I use them interchangeably and I don't want to quibble over terminology, really. And then there's a, there's a stable aspen uh, riparian type. So just to give you a, an image of those. Again, another landscape, southwest Wyoming. You can clearly see uh, different things happening on north and south facing slopes. Uh, those of you who are in tune and have been to our workshops, this is what Bob Campbell calls a see-through stand up there. Under here, where's all the babies, where's the teenagers, where's the young adults? So this is, this is a st the problem. When people talk about aspen decline, I, I, you know, I kind of say give some caution. Uh, to leave that argument behind very quickly, the real problem often is in these stable types where there's some problem or interruption of uh, regeneration and recruitment over time. So this is a work that uh, Doug Shinneman and myself, uh, Bill Baker and Dominic Kulikowski put together. It's really a review article looking at uh, basic types of Aspen fire types. And you can see there's a continuum from the stable in the lower left to the serial. It sort of mimics those functional types, uh, annual probability of fire uh, and the mean severity. This is a conceptual model, folks. And so you'd have different conifer types that are going to burn more or less frequently. And, uh, and so that comes into play here. Basically, what we're looking at here is a continuum of uh, fire independent to fire dependent types. We debated for a long time a sixth type, and we're still, there's just not enough research out there, but there appears to be uh, perhaps a type that's long-term serial that uh, kind of goes back and forth between aspen dominant and other uh, conifer dominant types. There's very low levels of regeneration happening over time, but it's not really shifting and it's not necessarily fire dependent, but more to come on that. Uh, the take home here is, again, different types and, and you need to understand that in different localities. <clears throat> So this is my humble slide, you know. Don't want to seem like we have it all figured out. Pure aspen can burn, particularly it's just down slope. There's some cereal aspen that gets running hot and goes up, up slope, but it doesn't go too far into here. This is probably a couple hundred feet or so, and then you see live trees in the background. And just for giggles and grins, uh, you rarely see, maybe Justin might be interested in this, a fire-scarred aspen tree. This is from... Uh, you mentioned just in the last presentation that large fire in central Utah 
where we had very low uh, forest cover. Can you tell me what that was again? Milford Flat. So it's, it, you know, it's 90% non-forest, but there's a huge aspen regeneration there that I was taken to. But fire to my right, all killed. To the left, some regeneration, but some cool fire scar aspen. I haven't found too many of those in my travels. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so to this theme of real resilience is adapting, so I'm moving into the, the management realm. This is just a take on the saving all the pieces, the Aldo Leopold kind of approach to thing to things. Um, this is the most widespread species in North America, sort of boreal to central Mexico and nearly coast to coast. Uh, so there's a broad ecological amplitude which already indicates that there's a lot of ways this survives and grows over different, different spaces and different times. So uh, it's adaptable if we allow it to. And so when I'm talking about resilience management, a lot of it is we, we sort of push things to the edge and make them less resilient. And if we have rapid changes in climate or fire regimes, uh, we may make it quite a bit less adaptable or less resilient. So this is the prevailing management paradigm as I understand it, and we can debate that, but emulating process to the degree possible in our management actions, and this insinuates a strong link between science and management. So I just want to point out that fire is not the only thing out there. Uh, we have things that happen stochastically overnight, and we have things that happen at a slower rate, and there's still disturbances, and these things interact over time. This on the right is a land, small landslide at the edge of Jackson Lake. You see the aspen stems coming in here, probably from this root system over here, from this mature tree here. But there's different, different types. Uh, I don't want to give you the idea that fire is the only game in town. There's all kinds of disturbance going on, uh, slow and fast at different paces. But uh, the research that's been done so far is, uh, uh, suggests that the interaction or overlap of multiple um, disturbances actually favors aspen because uh, eliminates the competition for one thing and keeps that regeneration cycle going. So back to the Sierra Nevada and Kevin's work. This is probably a message that most of you know, but basically we have a, a severity continuum, including management and cutting, uh, and a, just a higher level of regeneration very high level with the severe burn, less so moderate, and so on down the line. And the brown line here, uh, I'm sorry, the purple line is the conifer removal, which is the predominant management strategy for Aspen in California. And the do nothing is down here. So there's always, that's another thing here, is there's always should be some low level of regeneration or recruitment, and that goes, flies a little bit in the face of traditional Aspen management, but I say some low level because that's going on all the time with small pockets of light as they open up in the forest. And this just puts a visual on it. So the low and the high on the left, lower levels of regeneration. But regeneration is not the game. That's just counting how many sprouts come up. Recruitment, and I define regeneration as being basically lower than your head height and recruitment being higher than your head height. Uh, is important. So sheer numbers, again, a, ma a major metric in the past in traditional Aspen management doesn't always play out, as we've seen in a lot of places and a lot of these folks in the room that I've done field tours with. Uh, so little shift gears here, climate change, what happens with Aspen? It's schizophrenic again of two minds two drastically different minds. So this idea that drought will shrink habitat over time in this paper that came out a few years ago is gaining a lot of traction. It's a very sis, uh, simple uh, climate envelope model that just shrinks the habitat sort of upslope and you run out and that's that. Uh, it's a good first shot, but it's much too simplistic and it does not incorporate either different types or disturbance elements. Those are critical if you're trying to understand that. So, you know, and, and these, these folks here recently published a paper uh, trying to at least introduce the, um, the uh, disturbance element. So the other school of thought or the other mind with climate change and projecting Aspen health into the future is what an opportunity. If we're going to have more drought and fire, hurrah Aspen, go nuts, right? By the way, this is the same uh, hillside here where we were here for about 20 minutes and uh, Mary Lou Fairweather hiked around and found a seedling. 
in year two, year one comes asexual reproduction, year two, you'll find those seedlings hidden in there, often in high severity fires. It just takes the keen eye to find those, which I don't actually have yet. I'm only going to have one slide on either this. I spend a lot of time on this. This is one of the main themes I'm doing research on now. But there's a pretty stark example of this is a, a heavy drought disturbance in the Book Cliffs and the um, Utah-Colorado border, a large landscape study that we did a couple years ago. Remember I talked about recruitment being above head height and uh, regeneration below head height. Here we took recruitment as a percentage of live overstory trees. So are we roughly going to have live trees to replace the ones that are alive on the landscape now? Uh, this is sort of a dramatic example, but on, uh, it was about 80% of all the plots that we did, there was zero recruitment. So, and this is herbivory, folks, plain and simple. In this landscape, our analysis showed that it was dominated by elk herbivory and then secondarily uh, cattle and tertiary, probably mule deer. There were no sheep in this, but it was twice as much of the herbivory based on elk presence and amount of browse was from elk. So this is pretty stark, which brings us to our, our next message here, uh, in which I'm going to... I'm going to get really serious here and come right out and look you in the face. And this is that awkward conversation that you might have to have with your teenager someday. Uh, we want safe reproduction. Some of you are going to be uncomfortable. And if you're not squirming yet, I'm certainly squirming up here. Um, this is a very large landscape in southern Colorado. 20,000 acre fire in 2002. This blew me away. And I was out with Dan Binkley and some others on this. So there's a small fenced area, a quarter acre there, that's got some aspen growing in it, right? We have 20,000 acres of a complete type conversion. The state of Colorado estimates there are 256,000 elk in that state. This is from their wildlife department. This is completely unsustainable. This is shocking. So foresters, you know, they were almost coming to blows with a retired for a wildlife guy and, a, and Dan Binkley, a forester. This is a serious, serious situation. The elk were eating ponderosa pine. This is also should be noted, this is on private land, which is a de facto refuge the first day hunting season starts. And if you don't think animals can learn, just ask any of the wildlife guys in the room. They learn real quick. Okay, brace yourselves here. So abstinence will not work. Throw that idea out. Remember, you, remember, we're talking about Aspen here, so I'm not preaching to you. Uh, these things are going to reproduce. Imagine if your teenage son or daughter went out and didn't have a date at all, but came home with five of them just the same. Well, that's the asexual part. I won't go into the other part. Um, should we curb our burning desires? You know, we had a former professor here that just uh, always said, well, just put a torch to it. Put a torch to it. That was the solution to everything. Um, the question, the, if you haven't gotten the point already, it's sometimes yes. And then don't do it without protection. Come on, folks. And this is not realistic on most landscapes. You're not going to fence your way out of this issue. So protection is going to have to be innovative. It's going to have to be a tough road ahead. Some of the things that we heard about in this uh, collaborative group yesterday from Moreau Mountain. It's not a simple solution, and we're going to have to figure out how to talk better to each other across disciplinary lines, because this is a big, uh, big problem. And there was a talk earlier today about uh, lack of regeneration and some large fires in the Colorado Front Range. Um, this might be some of the for uh, formula here. If you have read some of Sam St. Clair's paper about Aspen being a chief facilitator of conifer growth, 256,000 elk. Uh, that's not ecology, that's economics, and that's another sort of area we need to bridge and do a better job of. So, <clears throat> this is a clear cut. This is an old story from Monroe Mountain as well, and it's completely a type conversion. Nothing growing back there, conifers or aspen. It didn't work, and this is when they, when they learned a, le a lesson, excuse me, and they're doing things differently. So, just to try to wrap up quickly here, um, I'm a big fan of these collaborative stewardships, they, but they are difficult. Don't let anybody give you the idea they're simple. 
Uh, and, and part of what the Western Aspen Alliance does, as well as some of these fire networks, is get information to people in a whole bunch of different ways. And if we're not doing it, let us know how we can do it better. That's sort of the take home here. But we're forced into this. We have shrinking budgets and we need to figure out ways to deliver things flexibly. Um, very quickly here, again, another whole talk is sort of setting up some kind of resilience management cycle, adaptive management cycle. Figure out what Aspen type you have. Use local experts. Get uh, all the stakeholders involved. Try to zero in on what the actual causes of the situation are. Sometimes there's multiple causes. Document, plan, implement, do something. Sometimes it's no action, sometimes action. And this resilience monitoring cycle, I would like to flip our funding upside down. When monitoring is the last paragraph in your report, and that's the one that gets cut first when the funding gets cut, I'd put it the other way around. I would fund the monitoring up front. <clears throat> so this is kind of a funny slide. Everybody looks like they're at a funeral. Maybe they are. So this is from the Wallow Fire in eastern Arizona. It's half a million acres. Uh, you have a little regeneration. It's all getting eaten. Everything's burned there. Um, and there, <laughs> it's not as grim as it looks there. It just caught them at an odd point, I guess. But so sort of some take homes here. I'll go through that real quick. Um, preserve processes. I'm very process focused. And I think we've sometimes get too zoomed in on composition. What's the composition out there when we're losing whole critical processes, not just disturbance cycles, but um, predator prey cycles, water cycles, all these things when things really get out of whack. Um, protecting the young in some way, shape, or form. Uh, species balance, not single species balance. When I talk about aspen forests, I'm talking about all those dependent species as well, the, the most biodiverse system of forest systems in the West, uh, aside from riparian. So public land, private land, collaborative participation, and that people play a part, and you've got to get them involved. You can't just walk in with a basket full of ecological knowledge and say, I've got the silver bullet here. We've got to deal with real people on the ground and work through those things. So with that, thanks very much. I appreciate your attention. We have time to, I guess we have time for a few questions. Rolled through a lot of information there quickly. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so her question is about alternatives to fencing, which we, I, in my opinion we need to develop now and fast. Uh, there's been some experimentation, uh, you probably laugh, but everything from putting Tabasco sauce on bushes to uh, some areas of more promise is trying to figure out um, genetic differentiation in chemical defenses and trying to figure out how that works on a landscape and how we might uh, take advantage of that. And it, it's in its infancy. A lot of things have been in an experimental environment, but not in a real landscape environment. Uh, guard dogs, uh, perhaps uh, intermingling with um, livestock grazing and browsing, uh, people on the ground, firecrackers, all these kind of things. We haven't figured out anything great yet, is the short answer. But, we're, but people are thinking about, yeah. Yeah, I got a little bit of trouble last time I was on this stage and I tried to get everyone to start howling, so I won't do that this time. <laughs> yes? Harassing. So as an alternative, she suggests perhaps just getting more citizens involved, get them out on the ground. They like these environments anyway, and, per, and perhaps they have noisemakers or something like that. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of citizen science. We just published a paper using that, uh, private lands. Uh, uh, citizen science, actually, they're taking the measurements, but just being out on the, on the ground and making some noise and, and getting around, that's a possibility. There's also some deterrence to that. Some people don't want to hear that noise out there, so you get into conflicts and those things. But uh, not a bad thought. Other ideas? If there's no more questions? Are there any questions? I don't want to cut you off. Okay. 
I know you want to get going. It's been a long day.